Hello, I'm Dr. Gloria Horsley, and I'm her daughter, Dr. Heidi Horsley. Heidi and I want to welcome you to Open to Hope Conversations, the podcast. We believe that the greatest gift you can give yourself after a loss is hope, using this moment to connect with others who have not only survived, but thrived. So let's get started. Welcome to the Open to Hope show. I'm your host, Dr. Gloria Horsley, with my daughter and co-host, Dr. Heidi Horsley. Well, Heidi, today we are going to talk about an important topic because we're going to talk about grief as a pathway to self-care. Wow, that's an amazing thought, isn't it, Heidi? Our guest talks about it. grief as actually a pathway to anything. I mean, I love the idea. I do too. I really like it because you don't, you don't think of it as being a pathway. You don't think of anything positive coming yeah. out of and that's why I love our guest today because she really is going to show us how you can go from survival not only to surviving but to thriving after really serious losses in your life and she's a great author written a lot of self-help books before she got into writing about grief and we're going to know more about her you want to tell us something about Suzanne Heidi she is proof of how human beings can rise again from the most difficult circumstances mom in 2012 her daughter Teal collapsed of cardiac arrest and died six days later, causing Suzanne to experience a spiritual unfolding. And as you said, she's the author of multiple and numerous things. She's written multiple self-help things, including How Much Joy Can You Stand? and Living Your Joy. She's been featured in Oprah Magazine, O Magazine, The New York Times, Self, and many others. And she actually hosts her own podcast, and we will find out from her how we can get that. And she has her own Facebook group called Self Care Group for Extremely Busy Women. So she's done it all, and we're happy to have her here. Welcome to the show, Suzanne. Let me say we are so sorry about your daughter. You know, in our world, um, it's not it hasn't been that long uh, since she passed away. A little over six years. Six years, yeah, yeah. Still tough for a lot of people, you know, oh. coming into that time, but. Um, I know that um, you talked about spiritual experiences and you talked about a pathway to self-care. And I think that's going to be so key to our audience today because your idea that grief can be a pathway is pretty profound. <laughs> well, it, it's the message I was given. I want to be clear about the circumstances of her death, which, you know, what her death certificate says is cause unknown, possibly due to seizure disorder. So she had epilepsy. She had a well-controlled case of it. She might have a seizure a year, mm -hmm. uh, but she took her meds and she took excellent, excellent care of herself. Right. And at the time of her death, um, she was living in San Francisco and um, she was working as a barista and um, being, you know, she was really a, a musician and she played the guitar on the street and made money from her singing. And she was a complete and total free spirit whose greatest priority was connecting with other people and being in compassion and deep appreciation for every moment. This was an unusual person. It was about six months before she died. At Christmas, she gave me a letter. And it said, you know, she lived on very little money, she, <laughs> as you can imagine, as a barista. And um, she lived on very little money. And she wrote me a letter instead of buying me something for Christmas. And she said, um, I had introduced her to a healer who said to her a few things about our relationship, which she shared in the letter. And she said, in this lifetime, we are meant to be leaders in light together. Mm -hmm. So as I received that, I didn't know what that meant because I was a completely driven workaholic internet marketing consultant who was <laughs> not black hat exactly, but let's just say the focus was clearly on me and making a lot of money and pushing everybody else around as much as I could. I was not particularly interested in slowing down and smelling the roses. I really didn't understand what my daughter meant when she said, mom, just be, you know, that was like, hmm, just be, what, what the heck? Mm -hmm. um, so we were very different people, but we were very close. And this message about being a leader in light was confusing mm -hmm. to me. So when she collapsed and I, I, I had gotten this call, I had just had dinner with her. 
and suddenly the hospital is calling saying your daughter's in cardiac arrest in oh critical gosh. condition and she was acting a little weird at dinner like a little spacey and i had a friend drive her home and that friend said was she like really drunk because she was kind of weaving as she got out of the car well in fact she was having petite mal seizures she went up into uh, the bathroom in her apartment the housemate didn't hear her come home she collapsed in the back bathroom the door was locked paramedics finally came and revived her but it was too late and she had irreversible brain damage wow so suddenly I'm in the hospital looking at her on the bed and I felt I had this enormous moment where the universe, God, spirit, whatever you call it, put a hand on my shoulder and said, your life will now dramatically change and it will become about the things that are important to both you and Teal and you will work together to help mm -hmm. people with oh. understanding. Mm -hmm. So where that took me was into uncertainty and I didn't work for two years and I just sort of agreed. That's a, an important key right there. <laughs> I mean, people that are I watching this. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't do anything. Especially since you were a workaholic prior to this. You know that? That's it. And I knew the minute I had that moment looking at her stretched out on that hospital bed, understanding she would die, I just knew that my whole life had to dramatically change there and then. So the first thing that happened is I closed my business. We tried to start something else and it was a dramatic failure because I was so broken. And I finally, you know, a friend of mine a few months later said, you have to stop. You just have to stop. So I did. And I lived with the incredible panic of uncertainty. I had savings in the bank, which I'm very grateful for because I couldn't have gotten through it otherwise. And then not until I was ready did work come to me and it was totally different work. And, and it came to me two, year, two and a half years later. Wow. And, and what did then, you do for that two years? I lived on my savings extremely frugally, just as Teal would have. And I lived in the bedroom of a good friend's house, the extra bedroom. And I cooked for her and took care of her dog when she was away. And it was perfect. She was such wow. a good friend. And um, we were, it was just such a soft place for me to land. And uh -huh. during that time, I just allowed myself to not work and not know and be in an open place and allow myself to really, really grieve. Wow. Incredible. And um, yeah, it was incredible. And I then started to have experiences connecting with, the, with one of the people who received her heart. So her organs were donated. Uh-huh. And a young woman her age got her heart, who's a, who has become a cardiac sonographer who takes photographs of people's hearts who are having heart issues because she herself had had congestive heart failure for eight years. And that young woman um, and her mother met me and her mother and I became very closely connected and I taught her public speaking and we started to do talks together. Oh my gosh. And that was the beginning of getting really back to these messages. I think it is so hard for people not to be empowered. And you were able to find a place where you could not only deal with it, but you could empower another person to public speak. I think that yeah. is, you know, being, we, nobody wants to be a victim and having everybody run around for two years saying, oh, you poor thing. People come up to you when you've lost a child. Anybody who's lost a child who's listening to this has probably had this experience. And they're so shocked when you say, yes, my daughter died or was killed or whatever, that they say, you'll never get over that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's a very interesting phrase because really there's some truth to it. But what does getting over it mean? Yeah, it right. means for me, yeah, you're right. Uh, but do I want to get over it? No, because right. my life was so toxic before this happened. Mm -hmm. And I felt Teal around me so intimately again and again and again during this period of uh, grief. <laughs> and I would hooked up in my little Honda Fit and I'd be driving it, driving it, driving it through all these country roads. And I had 2,000 songs on there that were on shuffle. And I would feel her come into my body and then one of her songs would start playing on the shuffle. And there were only 12 songs of hers out of 2,000. So that was always pretty cool. And, um, I, and I could really feel her um, reassuring me 
helping me understand it was okay to not know, uh, guiding me again and again. You know, I'd, I'd have an encounter with somebody who would say something about her and I'd look down and there would be a guitar pick lying on the ground. There were so many little signs that she was really with me and that it was okay to stop and take care of myself and focus on myself. One of the ways that I work with people in self-care is about returning to the self and asking yourself essential questions that have been brought up as a result of your crisis. Immediately, you are forced to stop. And the minute you stop, you're forced to notice everything that doesn't work. And as you notice what doesn't work, you are at choice about how to move forward with it. So a lot of my self-care work has to do with helping people find their way back to themselves through journaling. Now, there are studies about journaling that say that it's an incredibly important healing tool for grievers and for anybody who's stressed out. I have made my umbrella for my work extremely busy women, because that's who I was. Mm -hmm. And when we are extremely busy, we become deeply disconnected from ourselves. But when, other than uh, facing a disaster, do us extremely busy women stop long enough to consider our needs? Mm -hmm. Shortly after Teal died, somebody said to me, you need to ask yourself every day, what do I need right now? And it was such good advice. And I began to notice that I didn't know what I needed. Mm -hmm. I yes. love that question, don't you, Heidi? What do I need right now? Yes. And to not know, because sometimes you don't, you don't know. Right. Give me three tips on self-care if I'm really not in touch with it right now. <clears throat> All right. The first thing you have to do if you have experienced a great loss is allow yourself to really feel your feelings about it, which will be overwhelming at times. And within that, ask yourself, why did this happen? and just allow it, the answer, to come up. Don't lay your story on it, because it's gonna be tempting to say, because I'm that person who nothing good ever happens to, or because I didn't blah, 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 or because, you know, no. Stop and listen. Second thing is to ask yourself, what do I need right now? And sit with that question at a different time. You don't have to do it all at once. And the third thing to do is allow yourself to just be in the experience you're in and not push yourself to be doing something else that you think you should be doing. Mm -hmm. No should, it's just be. And that sounds like a very loose and not very specific idea. I really poo-pooed it, but let me tell you something, there's power in it because what it is saying is embrace what's happening around you right now and it might be something you practice for 30 seconds once a day, and that's great. Do this practice of being. Notice what's around you. Smell the smells. Notice what you're feeling. Notice if you are anxious, just being. Notice if you're scared to just be. Notice if you have creeping dread. Notice if you have flickers of joy because the experience of grief can be very interlaced with odd experiences of joy. There is a book that I wrote of essays right after Teal's death, a year of essays called Surrendering to Joy. If people drop by uh, Facebook and look for the self-care group for extremely busy women and send us a request, we will pop you right in there because we would love to welcome you to our full. We have thousands of women who are all helping each other get back to better self-care and that's where it starts is through community. All right, and what's your website? I know you've got a website. Yes, yeah, SuzanneFalter.com, and I'm also the host of the Self-Care Soother podcast. Great. Well, listen, Suzanne, I want to thank you so much for being on the show today. You're fabulous and, and fun and wonderful and uh, a perfect example to everyone is how you can find joy again, and you can go on even after these traumatic events. Thank you so much for having me on, Gloria and Heidi. Much appreciation to both of you. You're welcome. And, and Teal is definitely with you as a leader in life. And I love her personality, but she is, she is definitely guiding the way and you're guiding light right now. And she's yeah. together. Thank you so much. Well, we want to thank everybody for uh, watching the show today and listening. And Heidi and I, and I'm sure Suzanne, and I want to remind you that if you've lost hope, please lean on ours until you find your own. And God bless. I'm Dr. Heidi Horsley. You have been listening to Open to Hope, the podcast. 
You can follow Open to Hope on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. To learn more, visit us at opentohope.com and go to Apple Podcasts to subscribe. I'm Dr. Gloria Horsley. Join us again next week for another Open to Hope conversation, where we invite you to lean on our hope until you find your own.